So uh, I'm Kevin Chung. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Um, I'm a medical oncologist by training. I take care of breast cancer patients over at the SCCA. And my laboratory focuses on understanding how cancer cells spread to different parts of the body. That's the process of metastasis. And can we develop new kinds of therapies that might benefit patients with metastatic disease? I started at, uh, so I'd been, uh, I'd went, had my medical oncology training back in 2009. So that's when I started training to be an oncologist, a cancer doctor. Um, and I started as an assistant professor at Fred Hutch in 2015. So it's been five years. Um, moved out from the East Coast, New York. Uh, I was in Baltimore and came out here and we, we really love this place. My family's, um, we do have a, like, uh, come from a scientific family. So my dad's also a, a doctor and scientist. Uh, my brother's a, a physicist. So I come from, and I have a lot of extended relatives who are really into science. So our, our family get togethers tend to be kind of like really nerdy and like sometimes they show PowerPoints. So anyways, that's, that's what we do. But, um, you know, I, I, I grew up in New York, um, public school and, I went to college in Boston and Harvard. Um, and uh, I, after that, I was back in New York at, at Cornell, went to Rockefeller, for, did some research there. You know, I kind of bounced around between New York, Boston, and um, Baltimore, where I did my postdoctoral and training um, and oncology training at Johns Hopkins. As a medical oncologist um, and, and a scientist, the, the problem that I'm engaging with is metastatic breast cancer. And so, Breast cancer affects one in eight women in their lifetime. And this is um, a disease that ultimately leads to um, a cancer death in about 40,000 women every year in the US alone. And it's estimated over half a million worldwide every year. So this is a big problem. Now, when we think about why cancer um, is so lethal, it's because cancer cells have the ability to spread from one part of the body where they start to, to everywhere, to all parts of the body in a process called metastasis. Um, this can lead to metastases to the brain, um, to the liver, to the lung. And the complications of that is these, all these are essential organs. When these organs are faced with so many cancer cells, they don't work properly. And that leads to significant harm and, and distress and, and, and um, complications. Now, in my laboratory, we engage with two sets of questions. We're really interested in how breast cancer cells spread to distant organs that, that is on uh, using uh, at the various levels, genetics, microscopy, and uh, cellular mechanisms. Um, and we're also interested in understanding how metastatic cancer cells resist therapy, which is that, you know, when you think about how cancer cells spread or cancer cells themselves, it's oftentimes this idea they're very selfish. Cancer is a selfish process. Um, the cells in your body have mutated and they don't, be, they don't work with their neighbors um, and they, they sort of aggressively grow and take over their environment. And it's this thought that these individual cells then go on to seed distant organs and form metastatic tumors. Now, um, where we come along is that we've, we've done a lot of research in, in sort of um, model systems and patient samples. And it's, it's really surprising because there's, there's, a, there's a, an additional, a different view of this, which is that rather than thinking about cancer as this sort of single cell selfish process, it turns out that cancer cells also cooperate with each other. They're actually working together. And in fact, these cancer cells um, can invade as clusters of cells. They're connected together in little groups. They're able to complete these different complicated steps um, this ballet of invading through past the basement membrane into the into the uh, vasculature, surviving in the circulation, escaping to distant organs, and then growing in a very aggressive way. And we've we've termed this process collective metastasis. And this is an area which is not as much known about the process, but we think could open up new avenues to for cancer therapy uh, pre prevention and detection. So what I'm going to tell you about here now is this is. Uh, one example of this, what I'm showing you here, which, which is really neat, is um, okay, so on the left here, this is a, uh, an, an example of an organoid from uh, a tumor, breast tumor. 
And you notice it's starting to send out these chains of cells. These, they're, they're connect, the cells are connected to each other, touching each other along this process, but they're invading kind of like a spider sending out its little legs all over the place. We think this is bad. We see this in human breast tumors, and we think that, gosh, this cannot be good for patients if this is what cancer cells are doing. Now, when we look on another level, we see is that these cancer cells actually aren't all the same. They have like what we call leader and follower characteristics, kind of like when you think about um, in the military, there's a general and maybe there are soldiers and then they all, there's a hierarchy of things. Well, we think there's, we actually know there's a hierarchy of, of cancer cells and they all, they appear potentially, potentially, we're trying to work this out to work together. Now, it's also known when you look at the bloodstream of patients with cancer, and this is a variety of cancer types, not just breast cancer. You can find clusters of cancer cells. Um, these are known as circulating tumor cell clusters. Um, this picture here of the, um, this is a, 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 a confocal image, okay, of, of the example of this. Um, and basically what you're seeing here is um, a cluster of cells, these are in green, denoting EPCAMA marker of, uh, and so, so of, of breast tumor cells. Um, in red is a nuclear stain, in blue marks white blood cells. The, the main thing I want to highlight here, the main thing I want to highlight is that this cluster cell came from a patient with metastatic breast cancer. And when we find these clusters in the bloodstream, they tell you something about how the patient's going to do. And it's unfortunately it tells us that they're very likely going to progress on therapy and more likely to die. And so what we think is we got to we gotta kill these things. We got to kill these, these, these clusters. And that might be an important way of helping patients. Now, the, the other piece is, you know, how do we learn about a lot of the things we're doing? We work with a variety of models, uh, 3D models. Uh, people in the lab may be talking about these organoid cultures. I, I hope they talk to you about that. Um, uh, mouse models, um, human samples. What you're seeing here is an uh, example of metastases that formed in an animal model, a mouse model. Um, and the key here is that you see there's, this is a metastasis composed of two different colors. It's like, it's both green and red. And what that told us is that, uh, is that the metastasis arose from a cluster of cells. We are able in the lab, this is why we do laboratory experiments. We can, by controlling different variables, we can then start to really test our hypotheses and arrive at insight into how a complicated process like metastasis works. And so um, putting all this together, you know, this is an area that's ripe for a lot of exploration. This, this process of collecting metastasis involves invasion of clusters of cells. They get into the bloodstream, bloodstream and they're very good at forming seeding as a cluster and expanding out, which we're, we're doing a variety of studies to sort of get at how that works. I mean, the hope here, but, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, but also a physician. So the, the hope really is, is how can we help patients? That's why everything we do is geared toward this ultimate question of how can what we learn in the lab lead to new approaches that are going to benefit patients? And so um, that's, that's what gets me going. And I hope one day, um, I hope you can be inspired to do the same. My name is Ami, and I am a graduate student through the Molecular and Cellular Biology program at UW. Um, and I'm in the Cheng lab, and every day, I think it really depends on what experiments I have going. So sometimes in bi the biological sciences, we uh, have to use animals to model certain parts of the biology. We, in our lab, um, I'm sure Andy has told you that uh, we use cell lines and we use organoids, but sometimes that's not a good enough model to model what actually happens in uh, a, a patient's body. And so sometimes we resort to using mice or rats, depending on what else I have going. Um, maybe I'll be extracting RNA from uh, an experiment that I did or uh, Maybe I'll be sectioning some tumors um, so that I can um, stain them with antibodies and look at what's going on in the tissues. So I am actually an immigrant. I moved to uh, the US from Japan when I was five. And the reason why our family did that is because my dad was a doctor in Japan and he was a gastroenterologist. So he saw a lot of pancreatic cancer patients and he wanted to 
uh, come to the U.S. to do research on pancreatic cancers. And so he's been a pretty big inspiration of mine, although uh, up until when I was in high school, I actually was like, I never want to be a scientist, I never want to be a doctor because that's what my dad does and that looks really hard. Um, but then when I was around 10th grade, I took a biology class and I was like, oh crap, this, I like doing this, I like learning about this. And so I thought about what I wanted to do and I really went back and forth between wanting to go to medical school to be a doctor and uh, do, get, uh, going to graduate school, getting a PhD, and being a researcher or a scientist. And I ultimately decided that uh, looking back at my resume, I was like, oh, all the free time that I have, I'm spending on research. And so that must be what I like doing. And so I ultimately decided to go to graduate school. And I'm about halfway done. Uh, maybe, and uh, I have a few more years to go. Um, so yeah, this is a cryostat. Um, so it's basically a machine to cut very thin sections of any kind of tissue. And so here right now I have a block of rat tumor. So this is a breast tumor and I want to answer some questions using this uh, block of tissue but I can't just use the whole thing. Um, and so I need to uh, section it, make really, really thin sections of it and put it on a slide so that I can use antibodies to uh, look to see what kind of proteins are in there. So if I turn this handle, it'll bring uh, this uh, part down so that it touches the blade that's right here. And this blade is really, really sharp, so we have to be really careful not to cut ourselves. Um, and so if I turn this handle, uh, you can get this really nice, thin slice of tissue. Um, these are frozen OCT blocks, so it has to be kept cold so it doesn't just melt everywhere. So it's actually about minus 20 degrees Celsius in this, uh, within this machine. So now uh, I'm gonna be able to use this section to uh, see what kinds of things are in this tumor, so. I'm most interested in studying is uh, what's called the circulating tumor cells, which is basically when the cells are circulating in the blood um, and the reason why I'm interested in studying this is because it's really difficult and invasive to find, to obtain information about the primary tumors in patients. Um, so if you want information about um, a certain patient's tumor, uh, you'd typically have to do an invasive biopsy. So you'd have to put a needle inside of that tumor uh, to figure out genetic information and other types of information so that you can treat the patients um, in a more uh, targeted way. Um, but what would be really cool is if, so these tumor cells shed and that's what causes uh, the metastasis. And so these cells come from the primary tumor. And so if we can get information from the cells that are circulating in the blood, then uh, that could give us information about the primary tumor without us doing a very invasive um, sort of uh, procedure. And so uh, you can just uh, collect um, blood from patients um, in just a simple routine blood draw and hopefully we're able to get some information from just a blood draw instead of putting patients under anesthesia um, and things like that. Yeah, one advice that I have for high school students is to really take advantage of your resources. Um, so even uh, these things like you're watching this video right now about what scientists do, and people who are in these videos are typically people who uh, really want to like be connected to 
younger scientists and um, would be very happy to answer your questions. And so um, whenever people offer, or <laughs> even when they don't offer, um, I would say feel free to reach out to people. Don't be shy um, and just ask them uh, if they have time to like talk to you about what they do. Because I think that's really something that it's something that's like a learned skill to take to take full advantage of your resources. And I think it's really important to start practicing that skill early. I know it's really awkward sometimes to reach out to someone who you don't know, but I promise you that uh, we're very happy to take any questions. My name is Erin Greenwood. I'm a postdoc here at the Chung Lab at Fred Hutch. And currently I'm working on a project where we are looking to see if we can find cancer cells and presence of cancer in blood samples from patients. And so that involves sort of multiple aspects for me. One, we actually get blood from patients. Um, and then we also get blood from people who don't have cancer that we can then uh, spike in or add cancer cells that we grow here in the lab. And we can also sort of make our own fake blood sample uh, with cells that we culture and then combine and to sort of create sort of a, a, a fake blood sample that we can use. And then what I do is I test different ways and different aspects um, to find those cancer cells. And so a lot of what I do is just optimizing and sort of changing uh, tweaks to this protocol every day to try and get the best protocol that we can to find this cancer. So you're, you're making a lots of different types of crazy samples and see how hard it is for you to find the, the cancer yes. cells within the sample. Exactly. And what can we do to f make it even easier to find those? So is there different solutions that we can use? Is there different antibodies that might capture these better? So sort of what's the best way to go about finding the cancer from this blood? That sounds like fun. Yeah, it's really fun and it's very, a very practical application of science that you can directly see how it could impact and help patients. So I grew up, I was always an athlete, and so from the beginning I really thought I was going to be a doctor and I was going to do sports medicine and really stay involved in that aspect. And then in college I took a course on genetics. It was actually an elective <laughs> science course and it completely changed my mindset on what exactly I found fascinating with science. and. So I went from pre-med, luckily the requirements were all the same, <laughs> pre-med to pre-graduate school and ended up changing and then going to graduate school, got my PhD at University of Arizona and then coming here uh, to be a postdoc. Yeah, I actually, so I grew up here and then I went to UNLV in Las Vegas for undergraduate to play volleyball and then Arizona for graduate school and then after 10 years in the desert, I decided it was time to return to the Pacific Northwest um, and come back to the rain. <laughs> so these are the different cells that I'm going to be taking and making my fake blood sample with. So here on top, these are the cancer cells that I'll be spiking in to see if I can find them. And then these are essentially white blood cells. And so, what I can do is I can spike in a ton of these white blood, white blood cells and then just a little bit of the cancer ones and then I can see if I find the cancer ones within the millions of white blood cells I'll be using. So what I'm doing is I'm just making sure that they're nice and healthy before I use them in my experiment. So these are the white blood cells and they do not grow on plastic. They grow floating in the media. So all these little bubbles, those are all white blood cells. And then if we compare that to our cancer cells, which will grow flat on plastic, So here, our cancer cells are all of these cobblestone-like cells. 
And you can see some that look like blow bubbles. Those have actually detached and are dead and floating away. And then some are like starting to elongate and those are actually moving to a new spot on the flask because they're a little crowded here. So because the cancer cells grow while they're attached to the plastic of the flask, we have to detach them from the plastic so that we can use them and count them. So that's what I'm gonna do. We use a solution that just essentially breaks off their little attachments. And so we can collect them all and then use them in the experiment. So I'm just gonna wash them, get rid of all the nice media that has all their food in it. Suck that out. Add the trypsin, which is what will detach the cells from the plastic. And it'll sit in this for about 10, 15 minutes. You can always use the microscope to make sure that they're fully detached. I want a specific number. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to count them. And it's not as an easy process as you might think because there's so many in there. And I want a million of them. So to do that, I dye them with this tripan blue, and then I'll add it to this slide that has a grid, a very, very small grid embedded in it. And then I can count within the grid and then do some math and I can figure out how many cells I have in the whole entire flask. And then I can take the right amount for how much I want to use for my experiment. All the cells are here in the tube now. So I'm going to mix it up and then I'm going to take a very small amount and add it to our blue dye and then add that to the hemocytometer so we can count them. So here's the grid, and then these white dots here are cells that are alive. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six here, and then we can actually see which ones are dead. Let's see if I can find any. I have a very healthy cell. Oh, here we go. So this one is dark blue, meaning the dye got into it, so that means it's dead. So this way I can count which ones are alive and which ones are dead. Then I do a math equation, which basically says for the amount that I counted, I divide by four, because I counted four grids, and then I times it by 100,000, which tells me how many cells I have per milliliter. And then I have 10 milliliters, so I times it by 10. And so I have 6.5 million cells, and I need 2 million. So I'm gonna, figure out now what to dilute it in so that I can get my million cells. But I want my million only in one milliliter or two, sorry, two million in one milliliter. So that's where I'm <laughs> doing the math. I got my cancer cells here in this tube. I had two million cells that I needed for my experiment. So now I'm gonna keep those, put them on ice, and then I'll take them to the lab once I need them. You don't have to know what you wanna do. And in fact, I would encourage you to, if you find something you really love, do that, meet all the requirements that you think, 
you know, look up what you'll need to do, but really stay open to other career paths because I really do think that it's hard to know and determine in high school what you really want to do. And I think especially in college, I wish I had felt bolder and more empowered to take random classes earlier on. But with those electives, really take something crazy and weird. Um, one of my best classes was uh, morals and ethics and what's the difference between morals and ethics. And I think there's classes and subjects out there that you may not think will impact your life and help you, but I think are really informative and help you sort of approach things in a very different way. And so don't be afraid to take random classes or things that are outside your major and really explore those. I'm Andy Doak and I'm a graduate student here in the Chung Lab. And on a daily basis, uh, things are really different every day, which is part of what I like about science. I'm not good at really routine tasks over and over. Um, but I usually take care of cells a lot. We take cells from tumors to kind of look at them and study how they react to different conditions and how they grow. And then I do a lot of um, data analysis on my computer and I do that of images and um, sequencing data that we get from the cells. And I do a lot of microscopy and I think that's, that's most of what I do regularly, but things are always changing. So I have always liked science and math, and I thought I wanted to be an engineer for a long time when I was young. I wanted to work at NASA and build new spaceships because I like creativity and um, having to come up with things that nobody's ever thought of before. And in high school was kind of the first time I got exposed to biology on a bigger scale and learned about cancer, and I thought treating cancer cells, which are part of your body, but only slightly different, was the most creative thing I'd ever heard of. Like, how do you kill off only part of a human's body that's killing them without hurting the rest of them? And I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard of. And I started thinking about how I could get involved in that process. And I actually decided on maybe being a pharmacist for a long time. I went to undergrad and majored in biology to be on that track and usually for a pharmacist it's good to have some lab exposure so I reached out to a bunch of professors and ended up being really lucky and getting to work in a lab um, of someone who was studying cancer drugs and I was like wow this is really cool and really fun and I loved the community and the flexibility and how different it was every day and um, I was trying to figure out how I could incorporate that into pharmacy because I worked at a Walgreens and didn't love it. And um, someone finally told me about grad school and that it's free and that you actually get paid for it. <laughs> and um, I got really excited about that. And I thought, yeah, I could totally do that. So you mentioned earlier that you work with cells. What kind of cells do you work with? We focus mostly on breast cancer. so. A lot of our cells are actually from mouse uh, breast tumors that we take out and we look at them because it's, we get human breast tumor cells as well, but they're a little more random and it depends on when uh, patients are having biopsies. So we work with these cells and um, we call them organoids because they technically are like a little tumor when we grow them in these round balls. I can show you later. but. Um, they kind of copy what a tumor does in a person, but we put them in kind of these jello matrices that allow them to act like they're a real tumor just in a dish instead of in a person. And that way they're much easier to add different drugs or genetically engineer them to see how that affects what they do and how well they grow and invade. We're very proud of the fact that we've won the pumpkin carving contest three years in a row. It's kind of, that's our thing. Nice. <laughs> oh, hi. I didn't see you there. I'm just finishing up a prep of pumpkin DNA. It's very dangerous. Pumpkin level two, or what we call PL2. Now all I have to do is centrifuge it. 
This is our special pumpkin centrifuge. Just have to put these in here, make sure they're balanced. Put the lid on, make sure it's sturdy. And then we'll set it to max speed for 30 seconds. So this is where most of what we do starts. And this is an incubator. It keeps the cells at body temperature so they're happy and alive. Um, and I will show you some of our organoids. Um, they're hard to see in the dish, but you can see little white dots sometimes in there. And those are big clumps of tumor that kind of sit in suspension or floating in um, media, which my boyfriend calls cell Gatorade, which I think is very fitting because it's usually pink or yellow and has a lot of electrolytes in it. Although it's not sweet, I wouldn't recommend trying it. You can see a lot of little white bright dots and those are individual cells that are just kind of floating around. And these big blobs are those cells that have kind of come together and congregated and they form an actual mini tumor inside the media, which is really cool. So I'm interested in how these tumors, they ultimately end up shooting cells out of them in streams, which I'll show you a video of later. And those are able to kind of break through the tissue surrounding the breast tumor and make their way to the bloodstream where then they can kind of float around your body until they find somewhere they wanna sit down and grow again. And one thing I do a lot is we're interested in how different genes and proteins within the cell affect that process. So I actually just made a bunch of virus that's able to, we use virus because it's really good at getting into cells, as you may have heard about with coronavirus lately. Uh, but we can use it as a tool to get in different genomic editing tools into cells and maybe take out a protein or add extra of a protein. And that way we can see how much it changes that invasion when we put them in 3D. A bottle of cell media, AKA Gatorade. <laughs> and yeah, since we have these tumors outside the body, um, we need to mimic the body as best we can. So we keep them warm and we give them a lot of stuff that comes out of your blood, like different salts and amino acids and um, something called growth factors, which kind of tell the cells what to do. It's the way they signal to each other. So we put a bunch of that in this media as well as a gel that floats around and gives them something to hang on to. And they end up being really happy and just growing, which makes our lives really easy. Every kind of cell needs different things to stay alive and stay happy. So we add a particular set of different ingredients for each cell type that we work with. So this one's for our mouse tumor organoids. And we add insulin, which I'm sure you guys have heard of before, and a growth factor called FGF, or fetal growth factor, that um, is in all of our bodies, and penicillin, which is an antibiotic. Okay, so this is an example of a plate that I use to do the gels with the cells inside, and it has glass on the bottom, so that's really easy to image through because microscopes, uh, the light likes to go through glass a lot more than it likes to go through plastic. So you can get really pretty images that way. What I typically do is put antibodies on this, which can detect different, you've heard about this a lot with coronavirus, but they bind really specifically to one thing. So I can pick up uh, images, I guess, of specific proteins that I'm interested in looking at. So this is our little microscope room with a lot of microscopes in it. Um, this is the one I typically use the most. It's a spinning disc confocal microscope. A what? 
A spinning disc confocal. Spinning disc. Yeah, so I don't know a lot about the physics behind how the lasers in a microscope work, but there's basically some sort of flat spinning like crystal or clear disc uh, that helps the light focus and get really sharp. I think microscopes are by far the coolest part of biology. I think seeing is believing. There's so much you do in biology where you mix two clear liquids in a tube and send it to somebody and they tell you what the DNA sequence is or something and you never see it happen. But with microscopy you're watching these cells do things and you can see what's inside them. And I don't, it's just really cool to see and it's beautiful and you know you have full faith in what you're seeing because seeing is believing. And we actually put um, some water on top of the lens of the microscope, which you can see in there. And water, similar to how it goes through glass better than plastic, light goes better through water than through air. So this gives us a little bit of a sharper image. So why is it surrounded by like plexiglass and why does it have something that looks like air tubes sticking out of it? Oh yeah, good question. Um, that is in case we want to do a video, which um, kind of like I was talking about earlier in cell culture, you got to keep the cells warm at body temperature and they actually need carbon dioxide at a small percentage so they can uh, survive. So if we want to take a video with one of these two microscopes, we have to basically turn the microscope into a tiny incubator. So we heat pump uh, hot air and CO2 into it. And we actually also um, make the air really humid inside of there so they don't dry up. <laughs> um, yeah, and it gets kind of complicated. There was one time when our CO2 wasn't working and the cells were just all dying all the time and we couldn't figure out what was going on. And then we realized that uh, there was no CO2. Let me check which condition this is. Perfect. Okay. And so when we stain for different proteins, we use different fluorescent probes or antibodies that light up when you shine a certain type of light at it. Kind of like black light at a party is going to make everything white glow. If you shine blue light at a green antibody, it's going to light up and glow. So this is one of those organoids I showed you earlier inside the gel, and you can see it's got these fingers poking out in all different directions. Um, and what's turning green is keratin, which is something you've heard about in your hair and your nails. And we've found out, or my PI, Kevin, uh, found out a long time ago that the cells at the very tip of these invasion strands have really high levels of keratin. And we think that's helping them move through the gel and pull on it and pull themselves forward because it's keratin's kind of a long strand and it helps the cell retain its structure and cling to things and pull itself. So, I'm also trying to find, look at, um, I've also stained this for red, which you can see is much dimmer, but there's a handful of cells that have this really bright expression of red, which this is marking vimentin, another protein that, again, like keratin is kind of stringy, but you can see it's expressed or produced in a smaller number of cells than keratin, and um, it's in cells that don't have keratin. So for example, this cell right here is really red, but when we switch to green, it's much lower green than these. So, and it's at the front of an invasion strand. So uh, this is something that's been known for a long time, that fibroblasts, which is a different type of cell than a tumor cell, can sometimes lead invasion. And um, when we really like an image, we will take um, something called a Z-series because this microscope is so focused 
it can only capture a very thin slice of space in the organoid. So if we want to capture, I'm going to zoom out like up here, for instance, as well as down here, we have to take a slice at each different level, kind of like a stack of pancakes. And then we have software that later will squish them all together and make it look like one pretty image. Or you can also see them in 3D and rotate around, which is super cool. We have really fancy uh, software down in our core where we share a lot of resources with the other labs at Fred Hutch. Since things are really expensive, we can all pitch in and get some. And one of those things we have is this program called Amaris, which can measure the intensity of a dot within this 3D space. So uh, this is an example of that red color I showed you just a minute ago. And you can see um, where it's brightest, basically, and rotate around it to get a better idea. We're really interested in uh, what's at the very tips of these strands. So it helps us to look at it in 3D space, since they all go different directions all over. Yeah. So that's a colony that's spreading out, and the red tells you something about how it's spreading out. We hope so. So we're thinking, since there's a lot of red in the very tips, that maybe that's an important part of how these cells are able to do this. So potentially, if we later go in and turn whatever that protein is off, maybe they won't invade, is our hope. But we don't know yet. I think really getting to know your teachers would have been much more helpful to me earlier on. For instance, when I first started undergrad, I thought, oh, I don't need to talk to my teachers. I'll figure it out and it'll be fine. But it turns out that talking to your teachers is really helpful and they're really nice. <laughs> and um, there were a lot of situations where I got sick or um, something was really hard for me and I was able to meet with my professor later on in my undergraduate career and um, the, it was really helpful and they were often very understanding and helped me work through whatever it was. And then those people were able to help me get into grad school lately, later or um, give me advice on that grad school even existed as an option for me. We, in science, the goal is to do oftentimes very complicated, technically difficult, painstaking work to arrive at sort of what to outsiders might seem as just minute details. But the, the reason why this works is because by discovering and working so hard to obtain these details, we learn something very deep about the world. And that's what gets me going is that this sort of like, you know, at the, at the edge of this, of, of, of this mountaintop, you're looking over the horizon and you're, you're, you're seeing what's out in the distance. And that's really exciting to imagine what's possible. So science is both, it's grunt work, it's detail, but it's also um, creativity, it's beauty, it's, 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 it's imagination. And so um, I think for the budding scientists, you know, when you start out, maybe you work in a lab or you engage with science, oftentimes you're at that the ground level, which can be sometimes painstaking and it might be hard to understand why this is so important. Ask, explore. It's, the questions are really interesting. And the best questions ultimately will be the ones that you come up with yourself. And that's what I hope that everyone, every one of you have the opportunity to.